Good day, I'm Nolan Wobberger. Today we are going to be looking at almost philosophical aspects of what is mathematics really about. It's a very interesting question, of course, it touches base with philosophical or scientific issues and there's lots of different opinions that are possible. But I'm going to be sort of positioning things in a somewhat novel way, as you'll see, and there's a really essential dichotomy or duality which manifests itself. So if you'd asked the ancient Greeks about what mathematics was, they would have probably said something like arithmetic and geometry. At least when we're talking about pure mathematics. Applied mathematics, of course, also involves astronomy and other subjects. But a pure mathematics really rests on arithmetic and geometry, and later on algebra would also have been included in that general story. Now, which of these is actually fundamental has changed over the years, and with the Cartesian Revolution, the emphasis has shifted from geometry as being sort of fundamental to uh, more arithmetic. And that's really what most mathematicians these days, I think, would lean towards, that arithmetic is really sort of the, the bottom of mathematics, really resting ultimately on the framework of the natural numbers, which we're denoting by NAT or NAT. But in the 20th century, a new direction appeared. When people were trying to create a framework for modern analysis, they realized that things were a little bit difficult, and they ended up bringing in philosophers and philosophical approaches, which ultimately ended up in creating this set theory, this modern set theory, which ostensibly is some kind of framework for analysis. We are going to critique this uh, very strongly in future videos. But that was sort of the motivation for this introduction of set theory as a sort of foundational framework for mathematics. And in that direction, people started asking, well, if we're going to use set theory to prop up analysis, they didn't say it that way, of course, but that was really what was going on, then how about other parts of mathematics? Can we build arithmetic from set theory? And then they did come up with a scheme for doing this. And so by the end of the 20th century, we had this idea that first we start with set theory, and then we create arithmetic and geometry and algebra and analysis and so on from that. And here is this uh, way of constructing natural numbers from sets that goes back to John von Neumann that we've talked about. So in this framework, everything is a set, and the starting point is the empty set. That turns out to be what we equate with the number zero. And then we create the number one by taking this empty set and taking a set containing the empty set. So it's really the set containing zero. And then the number two, well, one way of describing it is that it's the set consisting of both zero and one. So here is zero and here is one, and that combination is the number two. And then the number three is the set consisting of zero, one, and two. So there's zero, there's one, and there's the two that we've just created. So we get this inductive way of creating natural numbers uh, using these ever bigger zoos of forests of sets within sets within sets. So if we ask something like, what is 78,143 explicitly in this system? Well, then we have a very big headache. And if we had to actually stare at that thing and write it down first of all and stare at it just in terms of these brackets, it would be a very big headache. But aside from being rather unwieldy, and I think to most people unnatural, this set theoretical approach to natural numbers also has some theoretical challenges. In particular, how are we going to define the operations of addition and multiplication on natural numbers when we view them in this very complicated set theoretical fashion? And then, how are we going to prove the laws of arithmetic from those definitions? Now, it is supposed by most practicing mathematicians that this has been done somewhere, somewhere over the hill. Some logicians have done this, and we don't have to worry about it, that the laws of arithmetic are just um, God-given to us by the logicians. It's an unhappy state of affairs, so it means that modern students aren't actually exposed to seeing the arguments in front of them. We're not talking about something that's very tangential or oblique. Right? This is a core issue in mathematics. How are we going to set up arithmetic with natural numbers? 
And if we're going to do it in such a convoluted way that we can only sort of point, have these indirect references to things which are uh, somewhere else, it's a very unhappy state of affairs. So the 20th century thinking has been very uh, disappointing, really. Um, there's this whole sequence of wrong thinkings that have been introduced uh, in this general direction. We have this idea that math is based on sets, that everything is a set. The definition of set itself is finessed by the use of axioms. We really ought to define what a set is properly if we're going to base everything on sets, but that's too hard and so we just assume that we know what a set is and invoke axioms to conjure up the things that really ought to be theorems. The foundations of arithmetic then become subservient to, well, unwieldy and overly complicated set theoretic arguments. The naturalness of arithmetic is lost. We're giving up our arithmetic to the set theorists. And, in fact, no one really views the proofs critically. When I say no one, I mean practicing mathematicians, students at universities, people who actually then use the mathematics. To them, these proofs are essentially non-existent. They're invisible. I think it's a very unhappy state of affairs. We're talking about arithmetic after all, right? We ought to be able to lay out arithmetic in a more sensible and more publicly verifiable way than this. So I'm going to be advocating a very different approach to arithmetic and how we set up arithmetic. Very different from the 20th century's point of view. So the advantages with our approach to arithmetic is that, first of all, we are going to be flexible about which data structures are suitable. We don't just have sets at our disposal. We have lists, ordered sets, multi-sets, as well as sets. And we have now some experience of being able to judge that maybe in certain situations one of these is better than another. So we have a flexibility that the set theorists don't. This gives us a big advantage. Our definitions are going to be clear, and they're going to relate directly to common usage and intuition. We want an ordinary person to be able to look at our definition and say, yeah, that kind of corresponds to the way we think about things. Especially when we're talking about natural numbers and their arithmetic, for heaven's sakes. Right? The theoretical manifestation of the subject ought to correlate with the way people actually do arithmetic. That's not asking that much. Our proofs are going to make sense. They're going to be visible. We can actually explain them to non-experts. We don't have to pretend that we need all kinds of prior logical training in order to be able to deal with the complexity of these, these proofs. And we're going to see that the doors are open to further insights into adjacent fields. Once we understand arithmetic in a better way, well, a lot of other adjacent things are just going to be more accessible to us. And we're going to stick to reality, okay? And avoid wishful thinking. Just because we want something to be true doesn't mean that we're going to force it into our theory. We're going to let nature decide what is true. All right, so here is our main definition, the key definition of what a natural number is. That a natural number is an M set, or multi set, of marks. Marks on a page. So, for example, this thing here, it's an M set, as you can see by the brackets on the outside, and it contains a mark, and another mark, and another mark. So these vertical strokes, or marks, are going to be the things which are inside our M set. There's only going to be one kind of thing in these M sets. They're always going to be the same, these vertical strokes or marks. So that's what we would ordinarily call the number three. That's going to be our official designation, or physical specification of what we informally call the number three. The number 17. That's what it looks like 
officially. It's a multi-set consisting of a lot of strokes and there is a stroke or a mark mark there mark 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 that's going to be our number 17 and notably we're going to allow because we're talking about M sets the possibility that there are no marks inside our M set that it's an empty M set and that's going to be our number 0 so as opposed to previous usage with this approach to natural numbers, we are going to include zero as a natural number. So it's a big difference from what we've been doing throughout this series. Up till now, the series has always taken the point of view that the natural numbers begin with one. But when we adopt this multi-set point of view, it's more natural to include the empty multi-set as a possibility, and so we have a natural number zero. Okay, that's all well and good, but there's still this question, what exactly is a mark? Okay, so it's something that we're writing down on the page. It's a, it's a symbol, and it looks a, kind of like a one, but I'm trying to make it a little bit longer than a one, so that we distinguish it a little bit from the number one. But what does it actually represent? So the answer involves going deeper. So I claim that the natural numbers are not at the bottom of things. That's usually the point of view towards modern mathematics. That there's actually something else underneath the natural numbers. And I'm now going to reveal what that is. There's something even more fundamental, essential, basic than our number system. All right, so what is this essential dichotomy or duality underlying mathematics? It's revealed here in this slide, which arguably might be the single most important slide in all of my videos. What do we see? Well, we see on this side, nothing. Nothing. On this side, something. There's a difference, the difference between nothing and something. I claim that this, simple-minded though it is, is really the essential core dichotomy or duality underlying mathematics. The distinction between nothing and something. So this mark or stroke that we're representing here, this basic symbol that we're using as the ingredients for our natural numbers. This is our representation of something. It's a symbol that we introduce which represents this intuitive idea of something. So we are definitely accessing our intuition here. Uh, we're not giving definitions of something or definitions of nothing. If we did that we would go in philosophical circles. We could do that for years and years talking about what does, what does nothing mean? What does something mean? Okay, I just want to base things on our intuitive understanding of those terms. We all have an intuitive understanding of those terms. And represent the something by this symbol. There are other possible symbols that we could have used and that we could use. So we've used this one here, but maybe somebody else might be more comfortable with a small circle, or a star, or maybe a slanted line, or maybe even a dot. Those would be alternative, completely valid ways of representing something. We could, of course, have other symbols as well. But the point is we're just choosing one particular symbol, and that symbol represents this primordial idea of something. And nothing, well, there's no choice about how to represent that. Maybe a lot of choices about how to represent something, but there's no choice about how to represent nothing. It's always represented in the same way, by emptiness. You leave the page empty. You don't put anything in it. That is nothing, in our view. That's how we're representing nothing on the page. It's just empty. So although we've given a general definition of natural numbers as M sets of marks, we still want to construct them. Okay? We want to create them 
put them on a page, demonstrate what it is that we're talking about explicitly. And we're going to do this inductively, which means one step at a time. And we're going to start with our empty M set, which is the simplest possible situation. It's the empty M set which has nothing inside it. It contains nothing. And we're going to give it a name. We're going to call it zero, because that's the traditional word that we use for that particular number. And we'll often write it as a separate symbol with this sort of O-type number symbol. So zero is, by definition for us, this M set here. So, in fact, this symbol here is extraneous. We don't actually uh, really need it. It's logically unnecessary. We could use just this thing here instead of zero everywhere, but we prefer to connect with ordinary experience and just then think about the usual zero as being actually officially this empty M set. So for us, this is the first natural number. It's the first one that we actually explicitly write down. Our first natural number is zero. And now we can construct more natural numbers. And the idea is always the same. We're going to take what we have and we're going to add something to it. We're going to insert something. So the next one is this one here. The set, or M set, consisting of something. It's a M set with a single mark in it. So you make a mark, you put it in an M set, and that we can say is the number one. And then we can take this one and we can insert another mark beside it. So we have mark, mark, that M set is two. Mark, 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 that's the M set three. Mark, 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 that's the M set four. Mark, 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 that's the M set 5. Notice how, first of all, how much simpler this construction of natural numbers is than the set theoretical one. Okay. Notice that it's actually a natural progression that actually mirrors ordinary usage. Primitive peoples would have written number 5 in very much this way. A bunch of 5 marks on the, on the page, a piece of papyrus or something. This is very natural. The only thing that's a little bit sophisticated that they wouldn't have done is putting everything in a pair of brackets to enclose it, to make the boundary very clear that the natural number doesn't extend out here or out here. So these natural numbers are so constructed in order. We see that it's not just that we have a whole bunch of natural numbers. Rather that we start with zero and then we start to sequentially construct more and more. There's a natural order. After zero, then we have this one, and 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 so on. And we can keep going, at least until our patience or our resources runs out. So this is very explicit, very concrete, and now there's no more question about whether we have a natural number or not. So from this point of view, you have a natural number precisely when you can actually write down a multi-set of marks. If you can do that, then that's a natural number. And if you can't do it, well, then you don't have such a natural number. It's a very explicit way of pinning down arithmetic to something concrete and, in fact, very close to our experience. So this is going to, uh, I think, be a, a good foundation for arithmetic. This is a very good foundation for arithmetic. But notice that it's exploiting our understanding of multisets. If we weren't comfortable or familiar with multisets, we might not think to do this. If we were only focused on sets, then we're not able to do this. So this is something that we can do because we do understand multisets. A big power that we've gotten from understanding our data structures and not just sticking to 20th century set theory. Okay, so one key ingredient in this discussion is this role of nothing, okay? Identifying nothing as a kind of ingredient in this story. 
And I think it's worthwhile for us to explore this a little bit uh, more and to discuss other ways in which this nothing concept is going to figure in the mathematics that we're slowly going to create here. We've already seen some examples of it, but we need to um, readjust our thinking a little bit because the way we think about nothing currently in mathematics is subtly and quite distinctively different from what I'm advocating here. So we have to get on top of nothing. We'll do that in our next video. I hope you'll join me for that. I'm Norman Wahlberger. Thanks for listening.